Now here we are, ready to talk about scapulothoracic mechanics. And really before we can talk about scapulothoracic mechanics, we really need to spend a little bit of time looking at um, some skeletal and, and muscular anatomy. We reviewed most of the skeletal anatomy in terms of the the shape and, and, and bony landmarks of the scapula previously, so we're not going to go really too much into that. I'm going to start today with looking at muscular anatomy and, and taking a look at uh, those muscles that really are directly responsible for scapular stability and scapular motion. So we'll take a look at those and, and then come back and look at some of the uniqueness behind the joints that, that connect the scapula to the, to the, ap to the, uh, And then we'll take a look at the joints that connect the scapula to the axial skeleton and and then we'll take a look at the joints that attach the scapula to the axial skeleton and recognize that it's really the only link between the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. So let's take a look at some some muscles. So let's start with the rhomboid major. Rhomboid major is in the posterior aspect of the thorax and and um, originates on the spinous processes of T2 to T5, inserts on the medial border of the scapula, just below the scapular spine. It's innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve. And so sometimes I'll see a problem with a C5 impingement up in the neck that reproduces kind of that mid scapular pain. So kind of keep that in mind if you're working with somebody that's complaining of a lot of mid-scapular pain and, and, um, and they might have a little kink in their neck. Now, it functions to stabilize the scapula and move the inferior angle back and, and upwards, but it also adducts the scapula. And we'll talk a little bit more about those motions specifically in a minute. So that's the, the rhomboid major. The rhomboid minor is superior to the major. And we can take a look at that rhomboid minor um, from its attachment along the spinous processes of C7 to T1 and its insertion on the medial vertebral border of the scapula, which is above the scapular spine or the spine of the scapula. Also innervated by the dorsal scapular nerve and, and it functions to adduct the scapula and move that inferior angle um, back and upward. So that's really a, a downward rotation of the scapula. So when I look at the levator scapula, and we've talked a little bit about levator scapula previously when we talked about the cervical spine, it's a posterior muscle in the thorax and it's posterior and, and uh, lateral on the neck and inserts into the uh, superior um, border of the, of the scapula attaching uh, from the transverse processes of C1 to C4 and also innervated by the um, the dorsal scapular nerve at C5 and, and with some, some branches directly from the spinal nerves of C3 and C4. And it functions to elevate the scapula with a medial and upward rotation. So we can start to see some similarities and some uh, between rhomboid and and serratus, uh, excuse me, rhomboid and levator scapula. So I am looking at pec minor. We can see the pec minor is an anterior muscle on the thorax. It's thin and, and triangular and, and deep to the pectoralis major. Originates on the third, fourth, and fifth uh, ribs and inserts into the coracoid process of the scapula. So this is yet another muscle inserted into the coracoid process. Innervated by the medial pectoral nerve at the levels of the C8 to T1. Functions to elevate the ribs and draws the scapula down and, and, and medially. So those first three muscles that we've looked at all have kind of a common action, which when they work concurrently will help in downward rotation of the scapula. So we'll talk, uh, we'll talk a little bit more of that 
uh, when we talk about scapular motions and, and um, scapular mechanics. So we have this big broad muscle, the trapezius, on the posterior aspect of the thorax from the from the occipital bone and the ligamentum nuque and spinous process of T1 and T2 all the way down to the we can see all the way down and in inserting into the, the spinous process of T12 so we can divide we can divide the, tra the trapezius into the upper, middle, and, and lower uh, trap. Um, the upper trap inserts into the clavicle, the middle trap inserting into the acromion process, and the lower trap inserting into the root of the spine of the, of the scapula. So it functions to elevate the spine, it functions to upwardly rotate the spine, it functions to elevate the clavicle, um, it functions to extend the neck when the, when the scapula is fixed, um, and it's really a, a, a big component of scapular stability. And I'm going to tell you clinically when I see this muscle, oftentimes I see a very overdeveloped upper trap with a very underdeveloped lower trap. And what tends to occur then during upward rotation of the scapula or upward rotation of the scapula has to occur with, with glenohumeral elevation is instead of getting appropriate upward rotation of the, of the scapula, I get more of an upward glide because this muscle overpowers the lower trap. And when that occurs, we start to get impingement problems. So when you've got those big weightlifters that come in and, and they're doing shoulder shrugs, and really working on getting that upper trap to function, I'd be willing to bet that they're not spending an equal amount of time on their lower traps. And over time, they're going to develop a uh, impingement problem, rotator cuff problem, probably uh, even a rotator cuff tear. So keep in mind what you're doing with upper trap facilitation and strengthening in combination with lower trap facilitation and strengthening. So serratus posterior, so serratus anterior originates on the upper portion of ribs one through eight, and inserts along the medial border of the of the uh, scapula. Innervated by the long thoracic nerve at levels uh, C4 through C7, and functions to protract the scapula but in combination with the upper and lower trap we have upward rotation of the scapula and, and thus holds the scapula close to the thoracic wall. So when you see individuals with, the, with their scapula that wings that's a good indication that they have um, weakness in their serratus anterior and if it's, and if it's severe there's a, a probability that their long thoracic nerve may be impinged or um, or they have a, a C5, C6, C7 nerve impingement. So that's the the serratus anterior. So serratus anterior, upper and lower traps function to upwardly rotate the scapula. So let's take a, take a look at um, the sternoclavicular joint and examine the um, the only actual structural attachment that the scapula has to the axial skeleton is at this joint. So the sternoclavicular joint is that articulation between the, the medial portion of the clavicle and the sternum and it's attached by a joint disc within a capsule. So it's a multiplanar attachment, multiplanar movement, synovial joint surrounded by a capsule. Upper portion of the disc is attached to the superior clavicle, while the lower portion is attached to the manubrium and the costal cartilage. So let's take a little closer look at that and see how it, how it functions. So when I look at the ligamentous con configuration, I have the sternoclavicular ligament, 
and the costoclavicular ligament. And this is an important ligament to take into consideration during elevation. And then contained within the disc, or excuse me, contained within the joint is this articulation between the, the disc, the clavicle, and the manubrium. Now motion at this joint is really dependent, strongly dependent upon this kind of unique articulation. The two articulations are incongruent, so it's a saddle shape. And that's why it's separated by the, the joint surface. The upper portion of the disc, which is attached to the superior aspect of the clavicle, and the lower portion of the disc, disc which is attached to the manubrium and the first costal cartilage creates two distinct joint cavities. So the disc acts as a hinge or a pivot during sternoclavicular motion. Elevation and depression of the clavicle, elevation and depression of the clavicle occur between the convex clavicle, convex clavicle and the concave manubrium. So the clavicle pivots on the upper attachment of the disc here. The disc stays with the manubrium as one unit and elevation range is approximately 45 degrees. Depression is approximately 15 degrees. Now protraction and retraction of the clavicle occurs around a vertical axis. Now given again this saddle shape of the clavicular surface, the configuration of the surfaces are reversed. The, cl the clavicular surface of the con the clavicular surface is concave and the manubrium is convex. So now the disc remains in contact with the clavicle as one unit during protraction and retraction where the range of motion is approximately 15 degrees in, in each direction. The clavicle can also rotate around a longitudinal axis that runs through the clavicle. Rotation occurs only in the posterior direction, an average of 30 to 45 degrees. And as we look at clavicle motion with the associated motions in the, in the shoulder, we'll, we'll understand how important clavicular rotation becomes. So the joint, again, is surrounded by these ligaments. Four ligaments specifically provide support. The anterior and the posterior sternoclavicular ligaments check anterior and posterior gliding of the clavicle, whereas the costoclavicular ligament is a very strong ligament that primarily serves as the axis of rotation for the joint during elevation and depression as well as protraction and retraction. There is an interclavicular ligament that runs from clavicle to clavicle, which checks excessive downward gliding and depression of the clavicle. Also serves to protect the brachial plexus and the subclavian artery. So that's the, the sternoclavicular joint. And very, very, very unique, very exciting joint to, to look at and study and recognize how important the contribution of this joint is to normal shoulder function. Now when I look at the acromial clavicular joint, I'm going to head to the other end of the, of the clavicle, which is a plain synovial joint with three degrees of freedom. It's supported by the acromial clavicular ligament as well as the coracoclavicular clavicular ligament. And the coracoclavicular ligament we've looked at a little bit previously, looking at the trapezoid and the conoid ligaments, uh, which make up the, the coracoclavicular ligament. So the clavicular uh, articulation consists of a small convex facet on the lateral end of the clavicle and a small concave facet on the acromion of the scapula. 
the joints supported by the chromoclavicular ligaments, as I said, and the coracoclavicular ligaments. The motion that occurs at the AC joint includes scapular rotation, winging, and tipping. Winging is an accessory motion which is associated with scapular protraction. And tipping is an accessory motion that is associated with scapular elevation. So that's the introduction to the mechanics and the muscles that move the, um, the scapula. So let's take a little bit, you know, let's kind of look at that three-dimensional uh, dynamic motion of, of the scapula, and then we will examine next time the relationship between the scapula and the glenohumeral joint. So first motion we'll take a look at is scapular um, an upward glide of the scapula. And this is a pretty non-functional motion. We can see that the primary muscles primarily responsible are um, upper trap and levator scapula. This is downward scapular rotation. And this is an important um, an important motion in terms of the activity associated with downward rotation. So primarily responsible, this is a great example of a force couple between the rhomboids, both major and minor, levator scapula, so we can see levator scapula pulling that superior angle up with the rhomboids pulling the inferior angle over and as I turn, we can see the pectoralis minor pulling the, the scapula down. So that's a great example of a force couple occurring between pec minor, levator scapula, and rhomboids. And now, typically when we're going to see this is during an active downward rotation and an actor active downward rotation is not when you you know return your hand from the overhead to to your side so that's an eccentric downward rotation so that's a lengthening of your upward rotators this must this active activity is really when you're pulling yourself up doing a pull up for example is a good example is a great example of active downward rotation so scapular adduction occurs when primarily the middle trap contracts and pulls the spine of the scapula toward the spinous processes. Now if I come around and take a look we can see through the ribs the rhomboids are also responsible for assisting in, in uh, that motion. Okay, so you're, we're going to see that motion during a, an upright row while we're, we're, rolling, uh, while we're sitting on the rowing machine, pulling open a heavy door, those kinds of things. And here's a great example of upward scapular rotation and this is what we need to look at when we're talking about the force couple that's created between the upper trap, lower trap, and the straightest anterior. Those muscles working in concert create that upward rotation so the, we can see right there where the axis of rotation is occurring. So we're not getting an excessive amount of, of elevation we're getting all upward rotation and we can see how that takes that acromion and brings it up and in clears the way for the the humeral head so that's examples of the motions that occur in the scapula next time we'll take a look we'll take a little closer look at um, the integration between the glenohumeral joint and the scapula and, and how that works together